All right. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Tuesday Takeover presented by the CTA Racial Equity Affairs Committee and our equity teams across the state. My name is Telly C, pronouns he, him, and his. I am a high school special education teacher in Los Angeles County and I currently serve on the CTA board as a director at large. Those of us who know the history of this country know that Asian Americans have been here for most of this nation's existence. They became part of this country in the same manner as many others some seeking a better life for themselves and their families, some escaping war, and others who did not go anywhere but became part of this nation through U.S. imperialism. From the very beginning, Asian American and Pacific Islanders faced prejudice, racism, and even violence. Nearly 200 years later, people in the AAPI community continue to experience this, a problem made worse by irresponsible and false claims that Asians are to be blamed for the current pandemic. At the same time, we have seen a greater awareness and support for the AAPI community, a greater understanding that the hate and violence towards the community and the issues of police brutality, immigrant families being separated, and inequities within public education are all interconnected in a society that is still gripped by institutional racism and white supremacy. Today, we will hear from a panel of four CTA members representing our AAPI community who will share their personal stories about why they became educators, what they think about the recent incidents of hate and violence against Asian Americans, and how they would like people to support the AAPI educa educators and students. We begin today's event with a land acknowledgement. I currently reside in the traditional lands of the Tongva people past and present here in Los Angeles. We honor with gratitude this land and the people who have been their stewards throughout the generations. May we honor their enduring presence on this land by committing ourselves to equity, human rights, and racial and social justice. With this in mind, I am honored and excited to introduce our panelists today. They are educators, leaders, proud union members, and courageous social justice warriors. They reflect the wonderful diversity of the Asian American Pacific Islander community, and I am proud to call them my friends and colleagues. We have with us today, AJ Kaur from the Martinez Education Association, Emily Reyes from United Teachers Los Angeles, Julie Kim from United Teachers of Richmond CTA NEA, and Joe Kui Angelis from New Haven Teachers Association. Before we ask our first question, let's give each panelist the opportunity to briefly tell us where they are joining us from and what their roles are in their district and in CTA. Let's start with AJ. Hello, thanks for having me. Well, currently I'm in Hawaii, but this is obviously not where I work. Um, we're on spring break. I'm in Martinez um, Elementary through high school. Actually, I'm a mental health counselor um, and my roles for our, my union. I'm the the co bargaining chair and vice president of Martinez Education Association. I also am a um, rep for state council. Awesome, and welcome, AJ. Uh, next, we'll hear from Emily. Hi, my name is Emily Reyes. I am a third grade teacher at Laurel Cinematic Arts and Creative Technologies Magnet School in Los Angeles Unified School District. I sit on um, United Teachers Los Angeles, their PACE committee and their West Area Steering Committees. Um, I live and work in Los Angeles, so I'm a Los Angelino. Um, let's see, what else, what else do we need to offer? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, and I am um, ex executive vice president of the Los Angeles chapter of the Asian, Ameri um, Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. Uh, excellent, and welcome, Emily. Next, we'll hear from Julie. Thank you so much. My name is Julie Kim. I'm a kindergarten teacher at Ford Elementary in Richmond. Um, I'm also the site representative for our local chapter, United Teachers of Richmond and Alcosta Service Center's um, Human Rights Advocacy Co-Chair. Thank you. Welcome, Julie. And finally, we'll hear from Joe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you, Telly and uh, REACT Committee for bringing us here. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm, again, Joe Coyangelis from the District of New Haven Unified School District, located in East Bay Union City, which is on the Oakland side of the Bay. I'm there. I, I serve as a 
high school counselor at the high school um, in student services. I also am uh, active with the NHTA, the local union, uh, serving as a site rep. I served as a human rights chair, and currently I'm the president of New Haven Teachers. I'm also an executive board member of Apollo, which is me and Emily's connection, the Apollo of uh, Alameda County. So they're connected to have the, with the community of laborers as well. So appreciate being here and talking with you folks. All right, thank you, Joe. And again, thank you all of you for, for being here, taking the time to be part of this panel. Our first question, uh, we'll hear from Emily first. The first question is, why did you become an educator? And what is your favorite thing about being an educator? Interestingly, um, I became an educator because um, during the economic downturn in the country, I had to reconsider going back to school. Um, I had previously been a massage therapist for 13 years um, and had built up a practice of um, predominantly like serving women um, and doing prenatal massage. And I'll probably talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but um, when I could no longer support my child, I had to reconsider um, what was I going to do um, to do uh, to be able to provide for my family? And I actually went back to school and I had always thought about becoming an educator. Um, I had always wanted to be an elementary school teacher. And so um, that's the reason why I became um, a teacher. I decided I needed something more stable so I could be at home with my child during the same hours and be available. Um, the one thing that I really love about teaching elementary school is um, it's it's just seeing when that light bulb goes on for my students, when they finally get it, like all of a sudden, like a door has opened up for them and, and all of a sudden, like so many other opportunities and are available once they got when that once they get that concept. And um, so that's that, that's what I just love about teaching. Um, and every year it's 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 always something new with them. So. Thank you. Great, thank you, Emily. And you, you teach third grade? Yes, I teach third grade. Okay, same grade as my as my daughter. Awesome, very very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, same question for Julie. Uh, my inspirations to become an educator are very deeply rooted in my early experiences of teaching in um, South Korea and also in some of my hopes of playing a role in closing the known gaps between schools and immigrant families growing up in an immigrant family myself. And my favorite part of being an educator is just the multitude of opportunities to express creativity, whether it be in the form of lessons and different projects, then that I get to put to life uh, with my students. Thank you. And Joe, next, uh, next up is you. Yeah, thank you. You know, my my journey to education was an interesting one. I was never kind of formally focused on becoming quote a teacher, uh, but my my where I came from, I was actually with the Department of Justice, Juvenile Justice, and so I was actually on the law enforcement side of the house, and one of my specialty was you know working with the juvenile gangs, and so by working on that, um, if back in the early. Uh, eight, mid 80s you know there was a big presence on juvenile gangs being really present in all different communities and started to rise in the asian communities as well and so especially that i was involved in was trying to uh, prevent asian gang membership which brought me into uh, union city and so we housed a project there in alameda county with a da's office to try to make an impact on asian gangs and so the program was housed at the New Haven District because at that time the district had some really um, progressive uh, gang related kind of policies. And so one of the things I was brought to do there was kind of develop some of those programs and implement them in particular to the Filipino American community because at that time the gang involvement there rose to a level of concern, so to speak, because they didn't match the typical profile of gangs because these students were BA students. They were coming from a full, um, you know, a home. There's no really heavy kind of um, 
uh, you know, those kind of break up families, just that typical thing that, you know, you see. So I was in, housed in this community. The superintendent pretty much said, hey, how do you like working with students? I said, that's ah, pretty good. I, like, I always liked working with juveniles. Well, how'd you like staying working with juveniles? I said, well, you know, I, I don't have any credentials. So I'll send you back to school. I'll send you back to school and get your credential and you could take care of business, you know, like you're doing already. And that was pretty much my journey into education. And, and, and this is going on my 31st year in education. So it was a long time coming, but like the other said, my, my always my passion was to help others to see a different side of the house. And that was one of my successes in juvenile justice to meet those uh, students, those juveniles, where they are rather than where they should be. And I think that was really a, a great thing because I, I had a lot of connections and same when I came into working with students here in, in the school setting. And of course, at that time, most of those students are high risk students, the ones who were kind of out of the path of graduation. And saw some great success with some of those students and meeting them that same kind of way of them where they are and what they de need to do different to make sure they, they get where they want to be. So it really has been an interesting journey. But again, uh, for the past 30 years, it's been an awesome place to be, like, we, like some of the others mentioned, working with students, seeing the wonder and achievement from them in your involvement. Great. Thank you for that, Joe. And uh, next we'll hear from AJ. Um, my, uh, Joe, I had no idea any of that, um, but it seems like we might have had some parallel paths going on. <laughs> so I was not initially going to actually be in education either. My um, interest was in, my undergrad's actually in criminal justice as well. And that's what I was I was going to be doing, um, you know, my goal was to become a probation officer. I was very, um, my goal, my hope was always to work with juveniles and try to get them out of the system. I grew up in Richmond and a lot of folks were in the system. They were, you know, offenders and young uh, juvenile offenders that we were trying to um, kind of move to some other program. So I, as I started working in the field, I was in this program that was a hybrid between probation and education. The Contra Costa County was trying to see, and then with uh, mental health built in. And so I ended up in this program and was like, well, this is, this is an idea of like, you know, we, we can't really like and it was for girls, it was for female offenders, juvenile offenders, and they built this mental health educational probation based program. So I had a mental health counselor, uh, um, probation officer and a teacher, a teaching team on site together. And there were these pilot programs throughout Contra Costa County. And I was, I actually didn't work for the program. I was the evaluator of the program. So I was coming in and do, I was working with, as a research assistant at that point um, with the focus of, you know, moving into getting to know probation and all of that. And then as I was going through that, I was like, wait a minute, like the probation officer literally just like, watches kids pee in a cup and tells them all the things that they're doing wrong. And it's really this mental health counselor who's there, who's helping them find these skills and to build these skills to, to not do the things they've been doing. <laughs> and I was like, that is more my speed. And as I, you know, started grad school and all of that it really couldn't have shifted my focus into mental health. Um, and then I knew education was my my passion. It was something that my dad really instilled in all of us. There's I have uh, there's four of us girls um, in my family, and so moving us forward as a he he was an immigrant, and you know education was the path. Like that was the path you took so that you can get where you needed to go in life. And he's he was very educated, um, especially for uh, someone who grew up in India, where education wasn't in our village, not you know, highly valued and, but he valued it. And so that was always my kind of path. And then I kind of veered into this mental health um, path 
as I was going through uh, through that and eventually came back into education as schools, at least in the Bay Area, started hiring mental health folks to work in schools. And that I haven't seen very much, but that's kind of how I ended up in this mental health. Um, and my my original like title was educational mental health counselor. And I was like, I found the perfect job. Like this is what I've always wanted to do, kind of mirroring those things of education and mental health for folks. Um, and and really helping them build the skills to find success in whatever they're doing and wherever they want to go, especially our young folks and guiding our families. Um, the reason I really wanted to be in schools was I never had anyone that looked like me. Even though I grew up in Richmond, my teachers were all white. I had one black teacher, no, two black teachers in elementary school, and but no one that looked like me. And that was something that was really important to me to become that person for my nieces and nephews. I worked in their in their school and that was something that was really, really valuable for me to be able to be that person, like literally for them. I wasn't their mental health counselor, obviously, but to have them see me on campus and navigating this world with them um, where there's not a lot of folks that look like us um, in in those roles. Thank you, AJ. And, you know, some of us know that last year you ran for school board, right? And you were uh, elected, uh, you know, an educator in, in, in a school board and, and you know, how, how important that is. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience? I did. Um, I was asked to run by the uh, president of the local in John Sweat. Um, school district um asked if i would consider running um and this was in the summer and it was something i had been thinking about and as a person of color especially in that community so i work in martinez unified i live in john sweat um school district and so that is where i ran and um and there is a very large population of indian folks and um i didn't really know. I mean, I knew that empirically because I could see folks around. Um, there's a large Asian community um, and Filipino and Indian community generally like in that area. That's kind of where we live. And um, so it was a very interesting experience for me. Um, I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't really have, I didn't care. Like, I didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest. I was like, okay, like, I gotta fill out the paperwork, get this going. And um, the amount of support I got from my community, from the Indian community and the Asian folks um, in uh, my area was, um, I would have never thought that. I would have never imagined how many folks would have um, kind of came out to support not only like voting for me, but also like word of mouth, people talking about it. I got a phone. My sister got a phone call the other day saying, oh, congratulate your sister on her run. Like I saw that and I'm like, how does this person even know me? And he is like, you have no idea how many people were rooting for you. Like our community is so close knit. They see your name and, you know, in our culture, you get identified with your father, which I have a lot of issues with. <laughs> You know, not that my dad's a bad person at all, but like I want to be an independent person, but you get associated with the family and but, but every because my dad's so well respected in the community, like it really kind of, um, you know, I ended up having the most votes and I was not somebody anyone knew before I ran for that election. I was not involved in John Sweat Unified. I don't have students in that district. My my nieces and nephews went to Martinez or they went to West Contra Costa. And I was I kind of live in this little slice um, in between those two districts. And so, um, yeah, it was it it was uh, it left me in awe of how much support my community came out um, and gave me and how um, that I that I won and that I got the most votes like the, it's been astonishing to me. Um, and now I'm on the school board and I forgot to mention that <laughs> when I introduced myself. Thank you, Telly. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah, that that's just you being modest. But but yes, uh, definitely you have a lot of support um, throughout. All right. Our, our next question, and we'll start with Julie this time, is uh, can you share your reflections as an AAPI educator in light of the most recent incidents of hate and violence against Asian Americans? Thank you. Um, I'm so heartbroken um, by these egregious acts that have really endangered and victimized the most 
vulnerable members of our communities, um, many who have come to the U.S. envisioning it as a land of opportunity, a global beacon of democracy and good governance. And I feel like these events were really triggering for me at a deeply personal level, too, because years ago, my own grandmother had been brutally attacked in her neighborhood while she was on her morning walk in San Francisco, and it left her with um, loss of hearing in one ear. And it was painful and devastating for our family. And I know from conversations with other friends and families and also with family, Asian American and Pacific Islander families in our own school communities that they are feeling fearful, confused, and really angry at the increasing presence of these incidences of violence and hate against us. Well, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And we're really sorry about that, Julie. Um, Joe, what about you? Yeah, thank you, Tony. The interesting thing, you know, as we all know, the last couple of weeks has been really kind of um, full of uh, confusion and wondering about how this is so much happening in this uh, amount of time frame. Uh, the one thing that I've been in talking to different um, students, uh, young folks uh, in the area, the one thing that really came to mind is the the thing that uh, the misunderstanding which we all have become uh, victim of the stereotypical piece of, of our in this in this case Asian American community, and I think it in talking to them, I found out really clearly how much that idea of microaggression has a pervasive influence on our young folks because in the microaggression piece if you don't or don't know it's when the little things are said to kind of chip at you in terms of um, your ethnicity or your your culture and so when those things are saying especially in the, some of the kids i talk to it seems like a kind of a funny thing but a lot of times when i talk to them individually it's really hurtful, but they don't have the place to kind of comment on how to change that conversation. And I think we're in a great time to kind of bring that awareness to our young folks. I also say that to my colleagues, because I think there's there, there really is a point of difficulty in coming out saying that I'm not very comfortable. I think what Emily mentioned about her, her history as a um, massage therapist and that whole feeling, there's a shameful piece that no one wants to say or bring up because that there's that hidden sort of stereotype of those kind of uh, work and professions. And I think that's what I, I got out of most of these uh, conversations in the community, how much we have to do to kind of enlighten them about how to look. And then, but the great thing about it is how we can, they're interested in changing up what they see because no one has said it's deserve it that's what you get kind of idea. It's really a wonder why it's happening. And so it's really been, a, for me, a, a good conversation, like I said earlier, working with the juvenile justice system, for them to understand how to change a behavior or a behavior they were raised with, which we know, unfortunately, many times, isn't the kind of community setting they want for them and our others. So it really is a time of a change for us and a point of action as we move through understanding this uh, treatment of us as well as others, you know, only, you know, we all know in a historic view because we know it's not the first time that these things have happened in the community, but I think it's the first time there's a heavy attention to it, and now we have to push back on what kind of attention we're getting, and that's one of our critical pieces on trying to get that awareness because obviously, like, uh, as example, the murder of the, the six Asian women, the thing that was highlighted and the attention was their work and their work was discounted, and their work shouldn't be anything to be at a loss of. It was dehumanizing that people were killed, but that wasn't the issue. It was like, oh, well, they're, they're just, you know, they're, quote, sex workers. There's no big deal about that. But I think now we have to get to that point of understanding and acceptance that there is nothing against folks other than they're thinking the separation makes a, them a target for those kind of treatment and excuses for that treatment. Um, I wanted to jump in there um, because Joe brought up the fact, you know, that I had previously said that I was um, a massage therapist. Yeah, I was a massage therapist for 13 years of my life, um, and I had not thought about it um, until like the last couple of weeks. Um, it was something that I actually I sort of buried um, and 
And it was due to the, um, the microaggressions that I would suffer under um, because one, I was Asian, I was a massage therapist, I happened to be attractive. So I, I would often get the jokes that um, I was a sex worker. Um, and initially, um, oftentimes the way I would respond to it was I would laugh along um, and um, not stand up for what I was doing. Um, and, and when the, the events happened in Atlanta, I didn't realize um, how it would affect me. Um, and it took me a little while to process. And part of that was because I identified with these women. Um, and I have found that, you know, I spent 13 years of my life doing what they did and um, automatically being assumed to be a sex worker when um, that wasn't what I did. Um, and the thing is, it shouldn't matter what they did. Um, and it, it to to have to criminalize what these women were doing and dehumanize them, um, I realized that the reason why I hadn't initially come out was because I felt shame. Um, I had I had buried these feelings that I had about having been a massage therapist. I didn't want to talk about it because people would often joke about it. And the thing, and and I, it was also why I um, built the clientele that I did because I was trying to avoid the jokes. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter if I was doing prenatal massage. I still got the jokes, and that had everything to do with the fact that I was Asian American. Um, and so um, the death of these women. Um, struck me so so very deeply because to classify them as sex workers when they are women who are trying to support their families and and their immigrant women is we need to stand by them. It doesn't matter what they were doing, and um, and I I had to take ownership of the fact that I that I had these feelings. And that I that I had in the past joked along with with it, the whole like the sex worker thing, when what I should have been doing was uplifting those that that career that I had, and therefore also uplifting these women too, because I should be standing next to them and I should be defending them because that is that they deserve dignity, these women. Thank you, Emily. Um, AJ? I am definitely um, feeling very thoughtful about the events that have happened and have been happening over the last year that have really targeted. And I think Caught, like kind of led up to the shooting that happened um, and the, the way that um, these women who were murdered were seen. But I want to take us back to 9-11. And, you know, 9-11, even before 9-11, the first Iraq war, um, in, in my memory, at least, um, I was in elementary school. And it gets really emotional when I talk about it. Because to me, that was when Indian folks started getting targeted, but nobody stepped up to defend us or, you know, we weren't really part of any community. We were just kind of our own community. And that and this was back in the 80s. And um, it was a pretty small community, at least where I lived. And um, but as 9-11 happened, now I was an adult. 
And um, I remember my dad on 9-11 saying to me, because he went to the bank, and I was like, Dad, like, why would you leave? Like, why are you going out? Like, we don't know what's happening. And he was like, he's like, I'm not going to live in fear. He's like, we don't get anything from living in fear. Um, and then... And, and and he he still lived that way and he's in his he's 76 now and and I admire that a lot about him um but in that I have seen my nephews be targeted because they wear turbans in our schools in West Contra Costa and with little or no support from anyone in the school district um and it, it's been it, to me, this isn't new. This is something that's real. It's an old wound. It's getting a new light on it. Um, but I don't want us to forget, like, this is, you know, this is not, it wasn't the Iraq war. This is back to our, you know, immigration, you know, how we, some of us were even brought over, you know, our, our history as immigrants, you know, and the internment camp, like all of these things. And we're just expected to be quiet and like not speak out. And I feel like this, I hope this allows not only our community to, as, as the Asian community, our very wide community of cultures to come together and stand up as one community and say, hey, like, these are not new issues. They're getting highlighted. They're getting highlighted in a really aggressive way. And let's use that momentum to build on the awareness of because Asian folks, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to say anything. If people don't know, you know, we're seen as weak and meek and we're not going to retaliate and we don't respond in certain ways. And Unless you're in a gang, you know, those are like the two, that at least West Contra Costa, I mean, I'm a Richmond girl, grew up in Richmond. That was how we were seen. And, and that, to me, that is unacceptable. And I feel like this is an opportunity for us to really b move us forward. And I think I'm moving our conversation a little bit ahead, Telly, maybe from where we were at, but I, you know, I am... I'm my hope as we're moving, pushing this forward and getting folks to talk about it because people don't talk about us. Um, I feel like we we uh, and I speak we collectively as the Asian community often get overlooked. And, you know, when my nephews were targeted and they're, they're both of their turbans taken off at school the, like, with no response from the school administration. And to the, where I had to go to the superintendent and basically like just sit in his office until something was ha happened where because they wanted to give my nephew the same consequences for responding to somebody knocking off his turban as to the person, you know, as the person who started the situation. I, and to me, these are the things that folks don't, th there's no knowledge. People aren't taking time to understand what does a turban mean to the Sikh to a Sikh man, to the Sikh community. And not only do our Sikh men wear them, our Sikh women wear them too. And what does that mean? And why do we not touch it? Why do we, like, I don't touch it. Who gives you a right to touch? Like there's so many levels to the, the targeting that has happened, but it's often seen as this isolated incident and it's not isolated. It's very targeted and it happens throughout the United States, throughout our schools we just don't talk about it and i think that culturally that's part of who we are i know in the indian community we don't talk about a lot of things and we don't talk about mental health we don't talk about um being discriminated against we put our head down we do the work you know because we're here for our family working is just you know my dad would often say this like you go to work so you can do the things with your family who cares about what you're working like you know they didn't get why i wanted to even go into the work that i wanted to do because to my dad working was a means to live a life with your family versus like having a meaningful work life and so to me I really want us to take this opportunity to not only have this conversation, but to move this conversation outside of just this community into, I don't know how many folks are here, but everyone taking this out and go, how have we overlooked this problem? This isn't today's problem. This didn't start with the shooting. 
you know, last, you know, last month, this has been happening. We're just starting, the media is now starting to talk about it. And how do we use that momentum to move us forward? Thank you for, for sharing that, AJ. Um, you know, it reminds me of how my my dad would always tell me not to bring any attention to myself, you know, to stay out of stay out of trouble. You know, you know, and I got to say, you know, being involved in the California Teachers Association, I've been quite a disappointment to him. So I'm I'm very proud of that. Um, this brings us to a perfect segue to our next question, which we will start with Joe. And the question is, you know, in light of everything that's happened. Right. And in light of the increased attention to things that have always been happening. Right. Uh, how would all of you like to see how would you like to see people support AAPI educators and students and, and our AAPI community? Uh, Joe. Yeah, I think like I mentioned, I think the need for that support is starting first with the understanding of why we need support. And I think like AJ said, the difficulty is it's never been on the, the big radar because obviously there's that crazy myth of the famous model minority that we're already achieving. There's no real need for you to do these things. Um, so I think that's one of the things that start from to find out and present to others around us that the Asian community has, is just as needy as all the different places that have come to America in different ways and also already kind of in a, that way of being looked at as separated from the general community. And, and, and again, we know what that means. That's a white privilege or white supremacy. So I think I, I'd like to see us, as uh, we say, move the conversation to a point of reflection and understanding. I think um, us having the awareness with the, with our colleagues because I, some of the talks I've had with colleagues, they just don't get it. Um, because like I said, there's never really even known to them. Like it's it's just shocking to hear when, you know, of course what happened in Landon and other things happened this past year since the famous 2016 crazy election, that all these things happening, we know in the Asian community isn't new to that these four or five years. But it's never been attention attention because it was kept quiet because there's a lot of times it was never reported. It was never newsworthy. But I think now we, we're at a point now that the oppression and treatment of us, the Asian American community, needs to have that attention. But the basic thing is understanding why there is a separation. And I think we know um, as much as, you know, going to uh, back in the day of uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, Japanese um, concentration camps, all those things like that. People just kind of uh, don't really think how it applies today. Uh, the Filipino community, the in, uh, Indian community that AJ just mentioned, the Korean and all the different Chinese, all those places of us have that kind of need, but because there's not understanding, and I, the thing I say all the time, the microaggression understanding. It's always like a bumper stinker mentality that people don't really have a deep understanding of what does that mean uh, for us because there, there's our community is a scene in the eyes of the tourist and I say eyes of the tourist because like Chinatown what a great place to visit but they don't know what Chinatown is about Japantown it's a nice place to visit but they don't see the general community doesn't see and understand what does that community do why why is Chinatown even there People don't really understand, like AJ said, Chinatown happened because that was a way to be secure with each other. It wasn't because, you know, we want to open up this uh, Disneyland, you know, uh, exhibiting culture. It was about security and uh, comfortability in this community where we were targeted. And those are the kind of conversations and awareness, I think, that we want to move forward to help the API community get in a place of understanding and a place of change, and, and more importantly, a change, a place of empowerment that we can and we have and there's no doubt I'm sure I can spend a whole hour talking about our achievements but I think that still has to get out to know what that is and our really place under the sun in this community called America so I, I look forward to those conversation and awareness thank you thank you Joe I bring you bring back a lot of memories of, of spending time with my grandparents in, in Chinatown in, in, in Los Angeles. Uh, and you're absolutely right about why why they exist in the first place. Uh, Julie, let's hear from you. How, how can we support, how can people support our AAPI educators, students, and community? Thank you. Um, I really stand by what Joe says in terms of understanding and empowerment. I feel like 
solidarity and really decolonizing our history and our narratives is important and necessary and that really requires turning the tide of decades of public rhetoric about being the model minority and really allowing our struggles to surface um, having the space to continue with the with these types of conversations through which we can then mobilize together and turn it into action um, and really in unity with and with the support of other communities um, something that I truly benefited from is the support from my own colleagues at Ford um, and that I also hope to see more of um, for our AAPI educators, um, students in the community is validation and understanding um, that the hurt and the rage that we feel are worth expressing. And I think really importantly is that when you ask someone how they feel about the recent events and they prefer to process it more privately, that that process is honored and that it's not used to measure the impact of these experiences on those individuals. Thank you. And I also want to make sure that we have time for everybody to speak. AJ. Thank you. Um, I agree with everything that has been said already. I, I feel like we have to, one, we have to get rid of this myth of the model minority and that we need to start that conversation of really understanding the cultures uh, that make up our community um, and have full dialogues about what those cultures value um, and what those how those values show up. Sometimes those values show up in what looks like complacency, but really that's not what it is. And let's have those conversations. Let's get to know our our folks that are in our community and, you know, in our school community. So if you have students, um, you know, don't, it's, you know, I, I remember it was, I, it was at a CTA um, summer institute. Somebody was like, stop with the, the potlucks, you know, the internet, we had our international day and everybody brings a dish. Right. And, you know, and that's kind of our cultural conversation that can't be our cultural conversation. Let's have a cultural conversation of what do you know about your history? Like everybody, sh let's actually talk about that. Let's create a lot of our cultures, my culture, let me, I'll speak for mine. It, there's a tradition of oral history and how do we value that? How do we bring that forward in our systems, in, in our classrooms? Um, we have the technology to do that work now that when I was in school, you know, maybe we couldn't do it in the same way. I'm sure some teacher could have figured it out, but that's not what happened. And But I think that's where we need, if we can start making small shifts in just opening up conversation of, I'm curious about you, not because I want to exotify you, but I want to know where you come from and what that means. I, I'm in Hawaii right now on, on vacation and um, somebody said to me, oh, you know, they asked me my cultural background and I said, I'm Indian. And she looks, the woman looked at me and she goes, you don't look Indian. And I, like, it makes my, like, I can feel my, like, my face get red. Like, th those are the things where, you know, I feel like people, I don't know what that means. Like, I don't understand, to me, I'm like, I, I've, I come from a, Indian family, my parents immigrated here, you know, those are the, we need to teach folks to have conversations about what does it mean? And I know my skin tone is one of those things that people um, want to talk about. Like I'm lighter than most Indian folks, but let's talk about colorism. Let's talk about all of these things versus making assumptions and make, and being like, well, folks are successful they have a good graduation rate we don't need to talk about it and we do we because our students are struggling our students are struggling and they're impacted when they're seeing their elders getting attacked on our streets in their neighborhoods in their families like you know and we walk around in fear like this fear did not start this week this month this year this fear has been in our communities and we don't talk about it and neither does anyone else no other community comes and says hey i heard that thing happen to you you're in your community how do you feel about it let's come 
together. Like, you know, or they do it that one time and nobody talks about it again. And these are things like if we want to have true change, we have to actually see people for who they are. And I, I know in our work, we've talked a lot about color blindness and this work that we've been doing in these forums. And I think that is just as important for our Asian community. We're not one blend of anything. We are, we need to be seen for who we are and learn about that community and ask questions, not make judgments. And I feel like there's a lot of judgment when someone turns to me and goes, you don't look Indian. There's a lot of judgment in that. And, and I want, I want us to start having those conversations with our students, with our families of our students and the impacts of all of these current events like we have in other situations, but we often are overlooked in a lot of ways in my, in my experience. Thank you, AJ. Um, Emily? Um, I appreciate um, Julie, AJ and Joe because they, they've actually brought up a couple of things that I really feel are really important in supporting not just um, AAPI educators, but our students as well. Um, when we talk about like getting to know like who we are as people, I think it's really important that we get behind supporting ethnic studies in our schools because that helps shape um, and uplift our communities like and gives them a stronger sense of identity of of where they fit in in this world like they are um, inextricably part of this country immigrants have built this country and i think it's important for us to look at um, the backgrounds of various um bipoc communities to be able to understand each other and um, and see our interconnectedness um and then that leads me to the i um ideas of um, what Julie was mentioning about colonialism, you know, within the Asian American communities, particularly my own, I'm um, Filipino American, there is um, rampant anti blackness within our communities. And Joe mentioned this before we actually came on. We were talking about how um, to have lighter skin, to be mestiza, is valued. Um, and I believe there is. There is that also in even Indian communities, and you know where we have a tendency to try to lighten our skin to become more um, accepted. Um, and the problem with that is it doesn't change what we look like. The whole idea of assimilation in this country, you know, where um, Asian Americans were pitted against other minorities because we were we were. We could assimilate, we could pick up the language, we would do the problem was is we're still not accepted. We're still asked, where are you from? Uh, you know, I've gotten that question so many times. Where are you from? And I'll say, Los Angeles? No, where are you from? I'm American. Uh no, where are you really from? And it's not where I'm really from. You're basically othering me and making me a foreigner in my own land. This is where I was born and raised. Um, you know, I think about my father, he didn't want my sister and I to learn Ilocano, which was his native language in the Philippines, like in the Northern part of the Philippines. Um, and because he didn't want us to have an accent. The problem was it didn't matter that we didn't have an accent because we were still we were still viewed for what we look like. Um, and so we have to, within our community, work on this idea of like this anti-blackness that's, that's in our communities that we understand our interconnectedness with our, our African-American brothers and sisters out there. Um, and that leads to, you know, we think about what's happening right now with the rise of the anti-Asian violence, um, particularly what happened in Atlanta. And we have to recognize how um, the police and the white supremacy structures see this as an opportunity to increase the police president, presence in communities, particularly of our black and brown communities, um, because they're using Asian Americans as a scapegoat. Um, and it's important that we start to look at the idea of like, we need to de defund police because they have not typically 
protected minority communities. And we need to look at this more closely um, and recognize that this is in inextricably linked together. Thank you, Emily. So we have a few minutes left and before we conclude today, I'd like each of you to take a minute to just share any final thoughts, any final reflections uh, that you'd like to share with our viewers. And uh, let's start with AJ. I'm really just glad for the space and this time to have this conversation. And I want to echo what Emily just said, like, we have to, we have to start working together um, as a BIPOC community. I um, have been horrified by some of the rhetoric that has been coming out, that it's Black folks that are targeting Asian folks. And that's not the reality of it. But that is another way for, in my opinion, and my experience of white supremacy coming in and dividing and dividing. And this is an, a huge opportunity for us to unite, to work together with our our BIPOC community to come together and say, we are taking a stance not against white folks, but against white supremacy and what has done, the damage it has done to our communities and to our, our students in our schools. And let's move forward together instead of kind of buying into this rhetoric. I refuse to buy into it. Somebody was trying to sell this to me really hard one day and I just, I cannot, I will not, I refuse to. And I hope that everyone takes Takes that away from this conversation is this isn't about pitting people against each other. This is about building community and moving forward against this idea of white white supremacy is an idea. It is not a person, and we have to break that idea down and get us and uh, get us into a space where we are actually united as a community of folks working towards equity and in all areas and i hope that that is the conversation we continue to have and don't buy the rhetoric thank you thank you thank you aj joe final thoughts uh, sorry about that finding that crazy mute button so the the thing i'll say and i think it's all of us um, i want to appreciate everyone who came and listened and shared with this conversation but I think the thing that comes to mind for all of us in this conversation, whether we're panelists or just participants, is the idea that to stop this and to change it, it has to become a daily exercise, right? It can't be trendy, like, so, okay, today this is the thing we're talking about. Okay, now it's gone. There's another thing going on. And I say that because that's the point of change that I'm hoping we can start. And I, I use these kind of words to reflect on a daily basis when I hear things or talking to folks. Awareness, knowledge, and change. Those three words for me kind of bring things to value, and I, I hope it can give some of you all that kind of feeling because once you have those things in mind, awareness of an issue, the knowledge of why that issue is happening, what what feeds that issue, and then now you can change. What do I need to do to change that? And that all comes from reflection. Each of us have to reflect on those three things and what it means to us as well as those around us. And I say that because obviously one of the biggest conversations I've had lately with the Filipino community in particular, and even uh, talking with my black brothers and sisters about the idea of anti-blackness, because it's such a place that people don't understand how that applies to each other. And I think once you reflect on it, you just take it to heart. What does that mean? And you get that awareness, you get the knowledge, and now you can change it up. And, and I say that my, my greatest example lately was I was at a, a rally, a Stop the, Hate, Stop the Asian Hate rally in Oakland. And so I was there and I was talking about some of the brothers and sisters on the street just talking. And they went into that whole thing about, like we mentioned here, the, the misunderstanding of the Asian black community. And they used some of the daily experience that we all know, the, the famous nail shop consideration. And so they said, oh, we don't get treated well, oh, they don't treat us well. But I said, you know, I asked, well, just reflect on that. What is the real value of that when you put it in a place where now you have this negative focus on this business, 
One, because now they're another reflection that they're Asian, and now now justifies the so-called hate and the famous, well, that's what they get kind of idea. And, and I said it's really uh, powerful because when I put it in those three words of reflection for them, they come back in a different place because this one uh, young woman, after the, at the end of the rally, she came back and she said, you know, I never really thought of it that way, but I'm going to try to do something different when I see folks hear things. And, and that's what I ask when you hear things, uh, speak your truth. Because like we said, when we don't speak up, because we do have the cultural thing of don't rock the boat, don't say anything because it's shameful, whatever. But unless you say anything, things don't change. You know, the famous word silence is an um, agreement, right? If you don't say anything, I guess that means you agree. And so I, I think I'm hoping that as we all reflect on these things going forward, that you can always do your daily effort to change up change up conversations and change up the reflections of others for them to think and, and make that move to do what we want to do which is now the whole uh, equalness of all of us in this place of life which we all have the exact same thing we want to live well for our family our community and for the next generation so again my thanks to everyone here and uh, my thanks to the participants Thank you, Joe, and uh, I have to commend you on your focus, uh, despite having the little one jump around, so thank you for that. <laughs> All right, uh, Emily, final thoughts. I think um, what's most important is that we need to become more involved and louder. Um, one way that I got involved um, was I became a member of Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. Um, you know, we're doing some great work right now um, with with workers um, and immigrants, you know, and um, right now we're doing our membership drive. And I think it's really important for us to stand with women in workplaces, particularly after what happened in Atlanta. Um, those women were simply working in their workplaces. They were underprotected um, and they were hypersexualized when they were murdered. And so now is the time for all of us to stand up and be a part of a movement in which we defend women of color and immigrant women and and the entire BIPOC community. Um, and so um, people should sign up to become part of these organizations. And right now you can join Apala if you just go to apalanet.org and sign up um, to join your local chapter. Telly and I are um, in the Los Angeles chapter. Let's see, Joe. Is, Joe, which chapter are you coming? Are you coming from again? Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm actually the Alameda County chapter, which serves Oakland, the Oakland East Bay area. So again, like she mentioned, uh, the famous words of and Monica is going to yell at me for saying this: "Organize, resist, and change." You know, that's on one of our T-shirts. So again, uh, pre, you know, the, getting involved is a way to kind of do that kind of change in a really open and loud manner. So appreciate your considerations. Yes, and uh, Monica, uh, Monica Tamarath, she's uh, the um, Apollo National President. Um, she's um, out of out of the Alameda County chapter, I believe, Monica. Um, so we're looking for people to join us. We're looking for allies, co-conspirators. You do not have to be. AAPI, you don't have to be a union, but we're looking for people to stand with us and fight with us. Great, thank you. And the last word uh, goes to Julie, final thoughts. Thank you. I also want to express my appreciation for everyone who joined in today's conversation as attendees, hosts, and panelists, and in really in echoing what has been powerfully expressed by Emily, AJ, and Joe. I just I truly hope that um, our AAPI educators will become more vocal in standing up for ourselves, um, as well as for other groups who are victimized by white supremacy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie, and thank you everyone for a wonderful discussion today. Thank you to Human Rights Department Manager Monica Tamarth for putting together this uh, wonderful event and to our CTA staff, uh, Michael Lamuth and Quinetta Gill for their support behind the scenes. 
And uh, of course, thank you to our amazing panelists, AJ, Emily, Julie, and Joe for taking the time to be with us here today. Uh, today's event and all past Tuesday takeovers are available to view at cta.org backslash REAC, R-E-A-C. Have a wonderful evening. And remember, we are CTA and together we are Union Strong. Thank you and see you again soon.